Hello and welcome to Sagentia Innovation's latest webinar, where we'll be discussing how to design your medical product to discover and address your users' hidden needs. Today's webinar is Human-Centered Design, Discovering Latent Needs in MedTech. I'm Josh Jackson, Head of North American Medical Business Development for Sagentia Innovation and your host for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's presentation. You may have an opportunity to submit questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the chat pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Please also use the questions pane if you have any technical issues and we'll do our best to resolve these for you. And now I'm delighted to introduce your presenters today, Carl Hewitt and Daniel Hibbert. Carl Hewitt, head of medical design and innovation, attained a first class degree from Loughborough University in industrial product design and technology. For 16 years, Carl has partnered with international clients developing cutting edge project, uh, projects across diagnostics, dental, and formally in FMCG. <clears throat> Excuse me. Carl advocates a human centered design mindset to create impactful user experiences and inform technology selection of novel devices using in depth experience in ethnographic needs translation, ideation, and design for manufacture. Daniel Hibbert joined Sagenda Innovation with a first in product design engineering from Loughborough University. Eight years later, Daniel is a mechanical engineering consultant and a core member of the mechanical systems team working on projects spanning the medical, consumer, and industrial sectors. Daniel enjoys working through the details of each engineering challenge to produce product and systems that are technically deliver and delight users. Carl, the floor is yours. Thanks for the introductions, Josh. So I'm Carl, and thanks so much for joining us today. So this is Speak. This is our award-winning voice-enabled surgical loop, and we developed Speak during 2020, and we submitted this for a Red Dot Concept Design Award in February of this year. And in July, we emerged from over 4,100 global entrants, and we were awarded the Best of Best Award in our concept category, and then put forward for the top five shootout for the Luminary Awards. Now, as an internally funded project, number one, we can talk about this, unlike most of our confidential client projects. And two, we thought it was a great demonstration to illustrate how human-centered design can provide value to early R&D. So today, we're going to share with you that journey of the initial discovery of some of the stakeholder needs, and then how we translated those into Speak. So first, I'll start with what is human-centered design, and it's fundamentally a mindset where we look to integrate a lot of methodologies focused on the view that if we understand people and their needs, we can improve strategic decision making and increase the effectiveness of product and service design. And it answers the is it real question and it can support the can it win and is it worth it question, which I think are key to defining one opportunity from another. So if we place ourselves in the user mindset, we're much better able to uncover the high value needs. Um, and we can use this focus to allow us to move from just problem solving to problem framing and finding. So in other words, we're not simply proposing to find solutions to problems that have already been identified. We're instead looking to identify and understand problems that have yet to be seen or have yet to be uncovered. And in the same token, I think it's important to frame what human-centered design isn't. So we often get some confusion with industrial design, and, and that's the discipline focused very much on the physical appearance and functionality and manufacturability of products. User experience often pops up a lot, which is a term that originates in usability. It was adopted by a lot of the human computer interaction designers in the 90s for digital and graphical user interface design. Um, that's got a lot more focus on sort of interaction and ease of use. And then finally, there's human factors engineering or usability. It's probably the largest misconception that I see. And human factors engineering and usability focuses much more on optimizing medical devices for safety and risk mitigation in accordance with regulatory compliance. You've got H75, ISO 62366. In actual fact, everything we've just discussed there, you could treat as part of human-centered design is kind of the parent 
Um, and you'll see as we continue through the presentation, but for now we'll focus on framing human-centered design and how it can differentiate itself, differentiate itself from human factors engineering. It's probably useful to first sort of frame a typical product development life cycle and some of those key milestones depicted with the diamonds there in the graphic. Hopefully it's familiar, broadly aligned to most of your experiences. So your initial planning helps define your user requirement specs. Your concept development and system design can contribute to the system level requirements. You then conduct detailed design, allowing you to conduct engineering verification tests. That might lead to possible refinement iteration. And that concludes then with design validation testing before you consider ramp up or deployment if this was a service. And if we map on human factors engineering, as we said, it's a process much more concerned with misuse and risk, and they're not naturally suited to early innovation. So at the outset, your user research and planning focus is largely on predicate information, prior incident reports, and key opinion leader insight, which can be useful, but reliance on that alone is often a bit of a bias and can stifle innovation. And then as you journey through the process, your formative studies guide preconceived concepts to be usable, and your summative studies are to validate comprehension and risk. So not a lot of sort of innovation use there. And a lot of those methodologies will largely focus on unmet needs. And it's a bit of a danger zone because it's important to recognize that individuals, stakeholders, they struggle to articulate why they do things or why they would behave in a, in a hypothetical. And it's good to remember that 90% of human cognition occurs in the subconscious. And the other danger is it's also because they're quite attainable, unmet needs, they're easily vocalized. It's likely your competitors are already working on ways to address these. Um, so new innovation really has to go beyond the, the unmet needs to unexpressed or the hidden needs. And the unexpressed needs can be known, but they're not easily articulated. So these solutions are usually evolutionary, which is great, but better still, if you can get to the hidden needs, they're your real game creators. They're the unknown unknowns, they're the things that um, are quite protectable, you know, from an innovation perspective, there's a lot of IP within that. And human-centered design processes and tools can really assist, assist with the extraction. And typically, you know, you're looking at the habitual coping strategies that people undertake that can mask real issues or some of the some subconscious um, acceptance, you know, this is the way it's always been done. I'm not going to challenge that. You really need to sort of see through that. So I'd like to explore a little bit on how we'd extract some of those needs. Many of you are going to have exposure to lots of different processes and there'll likely be some form of linear process, bumps, diamonds, loops, chains. They're all depicted in different sort of graphics and processes. And the key thing is there's loads of overlap and it's really all around a general principle of inspiration, ideation and implementation. So firstly, can you empathize with the user and get inspiration? Can you take that inspiration and turn those as inputs into derived concepts? And if you feel that those concepts and solutions meet the needs, you can then implement. As a process, uh, you've got three examples there along the bottom. In my opinion, design thinking to the bottom right is probably the most comprehensive fit for modern products and service development because it asks us to consider not just the user side has also got an element of commercial and technical, and this is really key to drive innovation, and it's great for incorporating marketing and strategy functions. So with all processes, you know, they don't necessarily articulate the specific activities or the connections into sort of a development process, and sometimes they unintentionally silo and sort of differentiate to the wider groups and teams. I don't think that's intentional, so it's nice to try and find out where do these fit, how can we better use them. So if we revisit that product development life cycle, I've tried to group sort of some of the human-centered tools that we can augment and enhance human factors engineering. And there are general activities that we can use to gather insights, that we can then use to derive concept solutions, and then prototype those solutions. So for insight gathering, we can use tools like persona mapping, ethnographical studies and journey mapping. And they're great front end tools that you can use to immerse yourself and extract hidden needs. 
and you can do this with observation, qualitative questioning, and you can understand the stakeholder motivations, the jobs to be done, the goals they have, and how they might interact with the use environment. System decompositions are really good to help take those needs and translate them into the tangibles, into our solutions, and we'll explore those a little later. And then straw man concepts, mock-ups, sketch modeling, rendering, 3D printing, all useful supporting quick iterative elements that can support that development journey and elicit quick feedback. And you'll note that all these tools feature quite early in the development journey and even before some teams are in a controlled medical development mode. So it's quite a low investment R&D activity for marketing the strategy functions to lead and drive inputs into then conventional engineering functions. So what we're gonna try and do is give a practical example using those tools. So I wanted to share our process of this initial discovery that we had for the need to speak and how we translated that into our final design, as you see depicted here. And the first immediate question is where do you start? And of course, it's quite a tricky one sometimes if you've just got a blank sheet of paper. The question's quite wide ranging. It's got a lot of answers because innovation can stem from many places. It's quite contextually specific. Um, it's difficult also to try and tailor a single approach, uh, but one that can adapt to different inputs is really useful. And again, that's where design thinking is quite good because it has this commercial and technical lens. Now IP, could be a starting point. You might have a piece of novel technology without an application. You have a need to diversify to an adjacent market. You might be reacting to external legislation or competitors or the ideal from a human centered mindset. You'll be afforded a more open question and you've been asked just to go find a problem that needs solving. And this is exactly our example and it stemmed from an observation. We're quite fortunate, we're quite lucky that we get exposed to a lot of technology in, in the work that we do. And I'm sure like many in medtech, you're observing the rise in use of robotically assisted surgery. And there's some interesting aspects uh, as benefits that these tools have on reduced dexterity, cognition and fatigue due to machine learning, uh, the machine, sorry, taking on some of the shared load. And therefore, it's interesting that the growth is increasing a lot in the mainstream, particularly in first world nations, but there are use cases and reports of applications where robotically assisted doesn't necessarily add value, but they're still being used. And even there are reports the FDA are warned caution in its use. And there's some examples recently with breast cancer treatments. And we thought about this, we thought about general world access and this advancement and concluded that, well, there's a significant portion of surgical interventions that probably will still maintain with open surgery. And that might be because of the high costs of robotically assisted equivalents, perhaps a lack of infrastructure and, and general surgical suitability. So we thought with that mindset, how could we leverage some of the, the pros of robotically assisted surgery, like fatigue reduction and the reduction in cognitive load, to try and do this in a more accessible form. And this became a working starting hypothesis. And the key thing is, once you've generated that hypothesis, you need to answer that first question, or is it real? And there are two aspects. Is the market real and can the solution fit? So if you remember at the start, I said we conducted this project during 2020. And one problem with that was that more traditional forms of insight like observational ethnography uh, that really do add value, you can get to those hidden needs by observing. But that was quite difficult due to the restrictions placed on us by the pandemic the lack of front end staff being available and being prioritized, of course, for their essential work that they were doing. So for us, we used secondary research methodologies. We reviewed images, videos, online literature, and we created a journey map framework. And journey maps are really useful for identifying hidden needs. You can map and place your identified stakeholders. You can then sort of position their journeys through the interactions with one another in an experience or a life cycle. And in this case, we mapped general surgical procedure through pre-surgery, during, and then post-surgery. And by reviewing and immersing how these different stakeholders interact, we can derive potential opportunities. Um, it can be sort of observational. Um, and in this case, because it was secondary, that's exactly what we had 
quite a few observations and we've blurred a lot of them out because we might use these another day but the one i've articulated the favored opportunity was our leading observation which was there was an awful lot of interaction and interplay during the surgical procedures with the surgeon having to compute loads of inputs from the surroundings and when we thought about the surgeon's inputs for making these decisions and observed you know, they've got different senses touch sight hearing well, the current visualization tools were surgical loops, and these seem to require a lot of manual intervention to control lighting and focal, uh, depth of field and focus. And it was particularly apparent during common open surgeries that there was some problems there. You imagine someone conducting open heart surgery, they are focused very much on the job in hand. They're either going to be taking their hands off the tools and adjusting the focal length for the uh, illumination themselves they're going to ask an assistant nurse to help with them slightly sort of moving their view in some instances we observe there are foot control pedals but nothing nothing really great and we thought well this is a great opportunity perhaps where we could look to automate this process of magnification and lighting control so it's great that we had the thought the next step we needed to try and validate that and we did that through landscaping. There's no getting away from it. It's a really low cost rapid tool and it's a great human centered design process that you can just use to benchmark your hypotheses and these first opportunities. And it really helps support, is it real? So the first part was to ground ourselves in the loop market. And what was surprising was loop technology has been pretty static for, for quite some time. And there was certainly room to innovate. The main findings highlighted two types of loops. You had fixed magnification loops, and there was the flip up types, or you had variable, variable magnification through the lens, TTL types. And the most advanced control features, like I said, there was some foot control systems. You're in some way tethered to the surgeon, to a surgical point, which wasn't great for maneuverability. And of course, in the extreme, we could see, not depicted here, but there were novel applications using like a Microsoft HoloLens some other early prototype AR systems. Um, didn't really align very well to the sort of first thought we had of affordability for the mass market, and obviously costly cloud-based systems that require network access. So we still thought, yeah, that this is good. We think there's definitely a more elegant solution that could be sought here. So the next point was to think about taking the learning and we employ a technique called functional decompositions. So they're really good rapid tools for benchmarking what is the, the now, the current state of the art, and then it allows you con to conceive alternate functions and ways of doing things. System engineers might be familiar with something similar with context diagrams, whether you depict flow of information and functions. So in the same way, we first mapped the type of system attributes in the horizontal axis. So we go you know, along there, the initial power options, different types of optics, the interfaces, the way you did adjust, how is the movement translated? You see, you start and you get to the end. And once we've mapped that out, we can then put on, well, what's the current state of the art? What's the baseline? And in this case, we use the uh, TTL system through the lens. So you can see there, we've just depicted some physical attributes linked to, to each bucket. And what we can do then is ideate different ways. And it's really good for focusing on areas that you think, well, actually, that particular attribute is, is pretty good already. We maybe shouldn't focus there because we're not going to improve that much more. But there are areas where we think actually doing something differently could really give value. And you can see from this quick exercise, you can derive lots of different solutions. So we've depicted a single one here that we linked up sort of a battery through the lens type using voice and a motor and a spur gear drive frame fitment and that allows variable zoom and you can sort of mix these and match them in different ways to create different final outputs in a short space of time for us we had unpicked what we thought was quite novel um, you could of course start developing the device uh, it's quite risky if you do that so what we wanted to do with our initial hypothesis for a voice enabled loop was to see well is this real and validate our thinking with actual users And this is where primary research is useful. And thankfully, uh, by this time, 
we were out of lockdown in 2020, we managed to actually structure some Microsoft Teams interviews. And we did this in two parts. The first was to structure um, sort of an unbiased understanding of the participants' roles, their working environments, the visualization tools that they use on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the next part was a bit more specific and targeted. We asked them to share their experiences through their current loop usage and concluded then with their thoughts and experiences on a voice controlled loop, which was our leading hypothesis and solution that we had right now. Um, we were pretty happy to confirm the feedback was really positive out of the users that we had. The main negative reaction was from established users perceiving cost of buying new loops, which were traditionally a one-time purchase, but overwhelmingly the idea of hands-free optical focus and illumination gave us the confidence to proceed. And we were satisfied clearly and thought, great, it's a real need. We've verified that with users, we could go straight off and re-event an AR headset that we thought was going to be the best way to do this. And yes, that's a real product, the picture there. But we thought a better thing first was to really immerse ourselves into the real world use of loops. So at this time, it's great to be involving the mechanical software and systems engineers. Uh, these are core attributes to a team that should be uh, involved very early on to support human factors and design leads. So I'm now going to hand over to Dan and he's going to introduce the next aspect of our human centered design process from the perspective of a mechanical engineer. Thank you, Carl. So I'm going to start with the following statement that the role of the design engineer is to respect the vision for the original concept whilst maintaining the technical feasibility. So as someone who had not heard of loops prior to this project, I would need to immerse myself and the other core project team members into the research tasks to develop our understanding around loops and loop users. When I joined the project, I was presented with the automated loops concept and invited to join the team conducting the user interviews. On completing these interviews, we still needed further insight into loop technology. We needed to better define the inputs to our system architecture. We needed to understand how and why loops are configured the way they are and how loops are tailored to the individual end users. We needed some loops of our own. At this point, the project team selected a high-end loops headset and we booked ourselves in for a loop fitting. For this session, I joined forces with my colleague Martin to give us representation from both mechanical engineering and the human factors teams. As shown in the bottom right image, the fitter presented us with a reference loop frame fitted with fiducials. Uh, using a tablet with specialist vision software, they were able to calculate the interpupillary distance and frame fit for each subject. When the loops are built, the two loop optics are set into at the specific declination angle and will converge to a fixed point and this is at the desired working distance. Therefore both the declination angle and the working distance are dependent on the combination of user stature and the wearer's desired end activity. Uh, so to this point two surgeons may be performing the same procedure uh, but the declination angle and working distance will vary depending on their individual anthropometric data. Uh, the key implication for me was that uh, the left and right optics needed to be interdependent or independent, sorry, from one another and conform to standard eyewear geometry and allow for to allow for successful communication of the loops um, to be customized to the end user specification. So the key learnings built up during the development were critical in making key design decisions. Keeping the headset lightweight and balanced is paramount to the success of this concept. So let's now discuss some prototyping. Our first prototype rig was built for testing software motor control. The belt drive concept shown on the left is technically feasible and also very cheap. 
However, it was evident that the bulk was going to interfere with the user's vision. The size would make the optics fitment more problematic and it would add significant weight. It looks pretty naff. So we needed something more compact. The second iteration was focused on miniaturization of the optic mechanism. It incorporates a small micromotor and minimal mounting hardware. Unfortunately, this arrangement of micromotor was not up to the job. Uh, the performance was unreliable. Therefore, we had to increase the motor size and beef up the mounting hardware. This to address um, alignment and rigidity issues. So we arrive at our third prototype. We've got the minimum mechanism size for a technically feasible product. And in this uh, prototype iteration, um, we've optimized the motor position, which we'll explore on the next slide. So drawing on our earlier fitting session and the primary research, uh, we understand that the use of loops is similar to the use of varifocal glasses. Users will predominantly be looking forwards through the glass lens. When the user requires additional magnification, they'll look downwards and peer through the magnification optic. So we understand that any obstruction of the lens area above the top of the optic needs to be minimized to preserve forward vision. Equally, any obstruction to the sides will reduce the user's peripheral vision. Therefore, the motor placement should be located below the optic outside of the user's vision, whilst avoiding any collision with the user's nose. Okay, the next challenge was to consider how to package the supporting ancillaries into a usable system for the surgical use case environment. For voice control to work well in a noisy environment, such as an operating theater, we knew that the physical microphone placement and noise cancellation technology would be key to our success. From our interview output, we understand that these systems can be used for upwards of six hours during a complex surgery. Therefore, component distribution uh, and minimizing the overall system weight will make the difference between the user's complete immersion in the surgical procedure and unwanted painful distractions caused by heavy components or poor weight distribution. Trailing leads had also been identified as problematic. So a form of integrated battery power source would be needed. Uh, power budgets were key to give us realistic estimates for battery sizes and weights suitable for our target runtime. We quickly mapped out a few schematics of the microphone and battery embodiments to discuss the pros and cons of each approach. And after considering all the data inputs, we reasoned that a rear mounted battery pack would counterbalance the front optics. A self-contained headset embodiment would facilitate the user mobility while still providing suitable options for microphone placement. Okay, I'm now gonna provide a brief summary of the voice control functionality. From a practical perspective, Having a device connected to the cloud makes it reliant on a stable and fast internet connection. By virtue of the cloud infrastructure, there are immediate privacy and security concerns, which can be a legislation nightmare for any medical device developer. Uh, we identified that local edge processing of voice data was possible using Sensory's truly hands-free algorithm um, and was an appropriate implementation and suitable for a medical device where reliability and security are paramount. So we were able to perform local edge processing of the voice data using an embedded microcontroller on the, our prototype headgear. Uh, we were able to test our command and wait word approach with the sensory mobile app pictured on the slide. Uh, this gave us quick feedback on the effectiveness of our choice of wording. Uh, then with our commands defined, we swapped out the smartphone for our own hardware implementation. Uh, we were able to test the performance of our prototype headset in our very own anechoic chamber. Uh, to do effective testing, the key trick is to simulate the end use case. Uh, we use directional speakers playing sounds, mimicking noises from a typical surgery environment, so from the operating theater. Uh, this allowed us to explore microphone placement on the headset and optimize our audio signal processing. 
there is a trade-off for swapping the cloud-based server for an embedded microcontroller. Um, you know, you eliminate connectivity and security issues. However, you've now got a keep concise choice of command words and you have to work within the hardware limitations of your embedded microcontroller. So the convergence of all the inputs and testing led us to our final mechanical test rig. This has been invaluable in delivering technical functionality and demonstrating our concept. It's allowed our team to wear and interact with the device and experience the voice and touch control interfaces. Further field testing and development is required to improve the usability and fine tune the voice interface um, with using surge and input uh, through formative studies. This technical demonstrator gives us a basis to start thinking about the practical design of the remaining uh, product elements. And this is where I like to hand back to our design team. So over to you. Thanks, Dan. Yes, hopefully you can appreciate where some of that framing, getting the mechanical engineers involved from that early stage just really allows them to make some quite objective decision making on, on the architecture. And as you say, there's a great framing now. And with that schematic considered, design team was reintroduced and we could really explore some of those options that allow us to visualize the touch points and the ways in which the users might interact with the system if it were evolved further. So think about some of the things we were interested in. It was sort of how, how would we integrate the battery? How would that retention strap be accessed on the back? How would the battery levels be communicated within Star of Field? Now, how can we make everything sort of sleek, cleanable, given the confines of the use environment that it was going to be used in? And really that's the benefit of having done some of the initial immersion. So without the grounding, it's quite easy to just go off on a tangent. You can waste quite a lot of effort just developing form for form's sake. It's kind of devoid of concept, context, but we can be quite objective now because we can perceive the situation from all our inputs. If you recall you know, Dan's experience with the loop fitment, we've done our secondary and primary research understanding use through both the eyes of the surgeon, some of the assistant nurses, the anaesthetists. So we can very quickly speed up this process. We're using tools like hand sketching. You can see here in the images, sketch modeling, physical forms using foam, more finalized 3D printing from some of the CAD, and we're using visualization software. Uh, in this instance, we use one called Keyshot, where it allows us to explore some of the color, the materials, the finishes. And, and really what is key, I guess I'd just stress again, that link up with Dan and his work, that exploratory mechanical work is a really helpful underlay, so to speak, for us to just evolve ideas, form, and function around. And it allows us just to converge so we can quickly get to a pretty considered system for our final design. We just go through some of the points, so we'd been able to sort of up the fidelity, so the battery pack, the electronics hardware, the headset, the adjustment control, all situated in that rear, like Dan was saying, to counteract the elements of the weight of the, the lenses and the optics on the front. We're going to use a high density LiPo cell. This minimizes the weight, but gives us that power requirement we think that was suitable sort of four to six hours. That sort of average use time that we figured from our interviews. And, and the battery can be easily swapped by the assistant without the surgeon having to remove the headgear. So really trying to think about minimizing the disruption during surgery. Try to think about the, con the contact points, considering the headgear, the headgear sort of distributes the weight, trying to avoid weight around the bridge of the nose, spread it across um, sort of some of the ears on the surface crown of the head. We've put in things like the battery LED indicators, just making sure that the power levels are easily communicable uh, to other people in their operating theater. It's below the line of where, say, like a, a hairnet would go. Um, the two LEDs themselves, we've got two placements, really trying to think about, well, reducing shadows. And again, with that optics that have been moved around and the mechanisms it allows and affords us to put it below that peripheral view that was really key. We've got 
two front mounted microphones we've got one in the rear we realized from our testing that was really important for the interference with the crosstalk all that suction line the beeping monitors the crosstalk from clinicians and then we could put in a few little embellishments as well thinking about an interchangeable strap on the top um, so one that can part in the middle slightly to cope for tied up long hair not just thinking about maybe more stereotypical male style hairs of female surgeons as well trying to be inclusive uh, we thought about the idea of accelerometers so if you think you're looking down your lights are on colleague speaks to you you look up you don't want to blind them so the accelerometer when you look up above horizontal just dims and switches off to avoid whiteout of your companion clinicians and in the event of a battery failure as well, the loops would automatically default to a three-time magnification, just so you weren't in a state that was unusable. So lots of little subtleties that all go to just improve that overall experience of use. So you really get to the final question in the journey, sort of, is it worth it? And it's, it's a pretty definitive question. And where I think human-centered methodologies can really help to fill in the gaps. So you can have that courage to stop a project quite early on if you don't think it's, it's got the, the growth to succeed, the potential. Um, but presumably at this stage, there's a lot of green lights because you know you've done your work, it's technically feasible, you've addressed and confirmed that it is a need, and that's a great starting point. There are two more questions really that you might focus on. And that's, will the product be profitable? At an acceptable risk and does launching a product make strategic sense really big questions um, and you'd hope what we've done helps with that so for that first profit and risk question there's loads of ways you can model costs and revenue like net present value um, but there are any models and they're only as good as their inputs and, and again that's where these methodologies can really help give you that higher confidence factor to those inputs so you recall our functional decomposition we did we explored those different ways to solve the different aspects of the system architecture the likely component choices that you might be so you're in a better position to build the type of system that's going to meet the need but not only that you've got that data now to consider when you're modeling the material costs the tooling costs the the component costs you know you've got a better idea quite early on to feed into those aspects of your team members that will be dealing with this modeling exercise and then for the launch and strategy question Obviously, that's quite a personal question unique to each organization, but the fidelity of these early concepts should allow you to assess return on investment by having a greater clarity on the technology maturity. You now we can prove an evidence through our testing, the, the technology is there, you can do it. You can assess, is it a good resource fit for your own internal capabilities? Do you have the infrastructure to execute that ratio of outsource versus in-source expertise? And I guess finally, the management support is often really key in these decisions. You need buy-in and you've got the evidence based on the insight, the early concepts to illustrate the need is met, the stakeholders accept this. And that goes along a great way, I think, to help put projects like this above those from different divisions that maybe you're all fighting for that same budget. Um, so this sort of takes us to the end, really. It's where we are with our development. And being an internal project, like I said, we're happy to share this with you. We were delighted with the results. We were really happy that it was acknowledged with an award. Um, so we hope it can inspire you and your teams to adopt some of these strategies in areas of your work. Um, and if, if you're already doing so, keep on working this way because we, we think it really adds value and make sure you're integrating those wider teams because we feel that multidisciplinary input from the technical marketing strategy really does add so much value. So again, thanks for joining, Dan and I, and we'd love to take your questions. Carl, Dan, hey, that, that was great. Uh, really fascinating uh, information, uh, really interesting to get an appreciation for your process. Um, uh, we're going to now begin uh, answering some of your questions uh, and that you submitted during today's presentation. Please note, you may still submit your questions through the chat pane uh, on your attendee control panel. Uh, let's see, uh, our first question. Uh, we, we really had quite a number that came in. Um, what was the timeline of the process from the initial insight to the concept of the project? Yeah, so 
all in through 2020. From that point, we sort of came up with the hypothesis to then that final solution. It was broken up because of COVID, but if you condensed it all in, it was about three to four months worth of work. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, you showed a single design output for the headset. Uh, what were the types of designs that you didn't show and uh, what made this one stand out? Yeah, so there were a fair few at the point, even Dan was conceiving some of the mechanical architectures to do with the mechanic structures that you saw. Once we got the underlay, um, the design team just looking at it in different ways. As I said, because we had so many insights, you know, we, we did conceive some more larger systems, you know, if any of you are familiar with sort of visualization systems, VR, Oculus Rift, that type of thing, you know, you, you could go down that route, but we very quickly just steered away from the less practical because we knew, you know, misting, fogging of eyes, we knew it had to conform to glasses that were sometimes prescription glasses that needed to fit to this declination angle, the interpluperary distance that Dan described. So it really did pretty quickly converge us to where we got to. And, you know, I say, so the insights allowed you to sort of design it yourself. It sort of designed itself along its way, which was really helpful. You know, for whatever it's worth, Carl, uh, you might say that, uh, but uh, that isn't the way most people think. So uh, I, I think that you sell yourself short. Um, <laughs> let's see, how do you weigh the benefits uh, derived through proper design with the costs that may be necessary uh, that would be incurred for the process? So how do you, how do you weigh the, the cost benefit analysis? I suppose is the question. So, so at the back end, like I say, you can do more I guess, de definitive methods like net present value, you can really go into the detail once you've got some of the sort of hard technical core there to allow you to do that analysis. But earlier on, when you're just sort of weighing up cost attributes, you know, that feedback we mentioned earlier, where we said um, one of the concerns from existing users were, you know, there's you no know, loops are not really expensive compared to surgical robotic, but they're not inexpensive and why would I necessarily want to change? So we were conscious when we were trying to conceive the architecture, what are we adding? You know, we're thinking about micromotors, some gears, we're thinking about the edge processing hardware that we needed. We're, we're looking sort of, of a, a bomb increase in the order of sort of 250, 500, 750 dollars. Is, is, is that acceptable? Is that acceptable for the given benefit that you get in the use? And if you can convey the use benefit articulated through the need, I think that's a really compelling reason how you can sort of justify that cost increase. Of course, it's a better product. So there would be an expectation that perhaps someone would be expected to pay a little bit more for that. Sounds like you're uh, wearing both a marketing hat and, a, and a, an engineering hat. Nice, nice job. Yeah, just to add something there, through our sure. interviews with our users, we kind of established what their expectations were, what they'd expect to be purchasing a top end loop for. Um, you know, the point was made that um, a typical user would buy one set and use it throughout their practice. So we'd have to deliver something um, differentiating to, to encourage them to, to um, consider, you know, our product. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, 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 this is. I thought this was an interesting question. Uh, you know, there, there's an awful lot of subjective input uh, that that could go through the process, uh, and I'm curious. Uh, or, or this person's question was, it's, he said, uh, I'm curious. Uh, you know, how do you wade through all those choices effectively? Yeah, and one of the negatives is so sort of when people think about industrial design, you know, it's subjective what's 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 the why you're doing this how are you making those rational decisions to get you to to the form that you've ended up with is this form over function should it not be function over form and again i think the the grounding that we've got in this process is if you can do the ideal and start with the user need you can try and extract and elicit the 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 unmet the unrealized hopefully as we're saying here the hidden needs it's kind of indefensible when you're presenting options you can sort of explore look there, there's video evidence there's observational evidence of someone struggling with this and we've presented this hypothesis that we think addresses that we've 
presented that back to those users who didn't even know that was a real need and you can you know, sometimes see the delight on their face when you're presenting early concepts so personally we find it's it's a massive tool that can sort of cut through the subjectivity yeah well i agree with i think that sounds good um it, it sounds like you had a, a limited knowledge of the market and, and the needs of the users how do you affect uh, how did this affect your approach to the project yeah so we are in some instances we're, we're all technologists in the line of work we do but also practitioners of process so it's part of the beauty of the human centered design starting points is you're afforded time to actually immerse yourself in the stakeholders in the use case environment and you over the course of a few weeks you can become, become relatively expert um, in understanding what should and shouldn't be and you're and you're using that as kind of your guiding light to, to inform some of these early decisions it's a common process in a lot of our early innovation that in the first few weeks there are the immersion phase and uh, it's all about just getting the teams up to speed in and becoming near subject matter experts yeah well I, I would imagine with the diversity of your projects that you've had uh it doesn't usually take too too long to do that good for you guys um let's see uh this question at our firm we are sometimes asked by marketing to solve to your problem in the field how do you find managing the discussion between r and d and marketing i mean historically it's it's been a gap that i think over the last five years is certainly something that's converging. And again, it's great to be in a position in, a, in an early ideation session where you're not just showing technical solutions that are derived from technology. In the process we've just shown, you know, the first starting point is often working with marketing colleagues, strategy heads within divisions of different organizations that are coming along with us to conduct some of the ethnography and some of the secondary research and you're you're helping them get that buy-in to go through hierarchy of needs you're translating those needs into solutions and like I said earlier it's kind of you can't really dispute it if, if you can evidence that look there is someone struggling with something or this is clearly something that's going to make someone's life better and now technical team you're empowered to realize it and, and exactly what Dan did and illustrated so it really, it brings the two together, I find, this process. It's it's good for that synergy. Yeah, well, that's good. It's always good to affect, uh, uh, you know, quality, uh, effective communication within an, within an organization. Uh, you know, Dan, you touched on this uh, a little bit. Uh, you know, maybe both of you could uh, address it. Clearly, uh, I, I, my guess is that the voice interface uh, sounds like it might have been the highest level of complexity for the project. How do, you, how do you mitigate that? That's a, a fair statement. I think um, these things are described as, you know, almost being good to go out of the box. You have a, a kind of web interface where you program your command words. Um, in reality, that gets you half of the way. So you have um, something that's quite responsive but then you're you're kind of thrown into the uh, technical challenges of, of microphone placement, of signal processing, of echo cancellation, um, and you know using the uh, knowledge and experience here at Syngenta Innovation, we have um, some scientists with with a background in acoustics. We have our anechoic chamber. Um, and then we have some great people on the software side who, um, you know, combine those resources and that experience that helps you really optimize the, the algorithms or, or to be honest on the software side and electrical hardware side to really deliver say 90, 95% uh, plus uh, successful voice recognition. Interesting. Uh, let's see. Um, what refinements would you make uh, to this design before it goes to the market? Yeah, I can start, Dan. So I think there's, you saw where we are with the 
the sort of the visual industrial design concept. Elements of that have been prototyped. There's still there's still some way to go in terms of actually engineering in the retention straps, engineering in exactly sort of the wire coupling through over on the head. So there's the sort of the back end infrastructure still to go on there. I think you could see the the mechanical rig that Dan worked on focused heavily and de-risked heavily a lot of the optical control. And you know, for us when we were hierarchying risk, that's one of the key things that we really wanted to nail to convey technical feasibility. Uh, let's see, we've got, we really have quite a number of questions here. Um, let's see, uh, the, the technical challenges you uh, had to make uh, compromise the HCD vision, how did you deal with the trade-offs? Trade-offs in the sense of, I guess, implementing pure compactness and you know the ultimate sleek design um we didn't go fully down that route i guess to counter because we were guided by all that early insight you saw the process that the sort of dan went through when he was iterating through the optic designs and sort of the motor control and placement you know yeah. it's it's easy to have to compromise because you go down a development route devoid of human centered design, you realize something is wrong, and then you need to change from the optimal form to re enable function. And you can see the methodology and route that we went. We were sort of educated and guided along the way. So it, the compromise that wasn't so much, I guess, is where I'm getting to, because if you follow this way, you can sort of re really reduce that and make the R&D effort quite efficient. Oh, well, that's good. Uh, that's what we are all after, and actually, obviously, that that uh, limits cost as well. Um, why don't I why don't I toss you guys a a, a softball here? Uh, uh, why did you think this process got uh, product sorry got signaled out for Red Dot uh, as best the best product design concept? Hmm. I think you look at the the finalists, particularly the meant for the Luminary Award. And I think there were three headset designs there, which was, you know, there's, there was a commonality there. I don't know if that's the, we just yeah. happened to hit upon a particular hot topic, but fundamentally, I think it was a strong offering because, you know, there was an articulated need. Um, it was a accessible implementation of technology that, that met that need that allowed, you know, not just first world countries, but, but others to, to consider this as well you know some of the things that dan was talking about about the use of sort of edge processing rather than cloud base it's it's an intelligent implementation of technology that works within the confines of the the operating theater and sort of data protection uh and fundamentally it was a compelling usable output you know you you can you often when you see something in a concept form it doesn't always look convincing it doesn't look real because context, size, aesthetics aren't quite right, but I think the process that we did really converged to something pretty tight. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, most of us now would have experienced maybe a, a smart hub in our homes, sometimes more successfully than others. Um, and often it, it can be quite a novelty, you know, what do you use it for? Checking the weather or uh, playing some music. So is exciting to find a use case where um, the, the, in the context of, of surgery, adding voice interface to a surgical loop can add um, meaningful function and be of, of genuine benefit to the end user. So if we can give a surgeon who's performing surgery is donned in PPE with hands full of tools, um, they can then through voice command change their magnification um, that's a great benefit because they would previously have to down their tools or ask an assistant to do that so we, we're going from seeing you know quite widespread but often a, a novelty kind of applications of voice to something more meaningful 
Uh, let's see. Why don't we uh, why don't we make this uh, the, the last question? Um, we'll certainly get to uh, other questions uh, directly if you have them. Uh, the the depth of your internal research is impressive. Uh, do you do a fair number of internal projects like this throughout the year? Either one of you able to address that? Yeah. So yeah, we have an internal projects division that we look at. Yeah, all manner of novel applications and where we think technology could be applied um, sometimes that's for for the betterment and upskilling of our of our own people because there's a particular skill set we think we should be um, becoming experts on that not necessarily clients are looking at at the minute but we think is going to be topical so yeah it's it's a uh, it's an intended process that we have in here and sometimes it, it comes good like this one where we can really apply the, the output to apply for something like an award and we're so thankful that we won this one yeah well i i think it's clearly evident uh, just looking frankly looking at the, the final product uh it, it looks terrific uh and uh you know just uh seeing that is is going to be very edify edifying for for the whole team uh let's see well we're respecting everyone's time uh that is all we'll have for you today we hope that you enjoy the presentation Thank you, Carl and Daniel. I realize there are still questions we did not have time to respond to. Carl and Daniel at the Sagenti Innovation Team will be sure to follow up with those of you who have asked questions and did not hear a response today. Please note, if you'd like to watch this presentation again or share this webinar with your colleagues, we'll be sending uh, you a link and you may find it on our website at sagentiinnovation.com in the coming days. If you'd like more information about the topics we have discussed here today, please be in touch with us at info at sagentiinnovation.com. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey and we would appreciate it if you complete it and provide us with your feedback. It will help us to continue to improve, provide you with meaningful content in the future. For additional information or learn more about Sagenti Innovation, please follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. On behalf of Sagenta Innovation and our presenters, Carl Hewitt and Daniel Hibbert, thank you again for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day.